Good morning, everybody. Maybe it's not morning when you're listening to this or watching this, but welcome to Punch Kick Choke Chat, one of our offshoot episodes that we've started doing. I'm so excited about this. I love the way we're uh, mobilizing this platform. My name's Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts, and uh, I'm going to make some fairly brief introductions. If you've been following our nighttime hour and a half long shows, uh, this is going to seem brief to you, but we want to just jump into a single topic, and I'm going to talk about that in a sec. Um, so uh, my name's Sean Benson. I'm a fifth degree black belt with Legacy Shore and Rue. Um, on our call, one of our hosts is Sensei Randy Dauphin. He's a seventh degree black belt, and he is also a fourth degree black belt in the Ido. And then Sensei Nicolas Suino, who's an eighth Dan in the Ido, a sixth Dan in Jiu-Jitsu and Judo. Hanshi Legacy, who's a 10th degree black belt, as well is a black belt in the Ido. And our guest today is Kyoshi Adet Rice, who's a seventh degree black belt. And um, I'm going to throw this to Sensei Dauphin to talk about our topic, which is why we've got Sensei Rice here today. Sensei Dauphin, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks for that introduction. Thanks for keeping it brief. Um, we all know who we are and everybody else knows who we are too. Um, uh, yeah, the topic that we're going to explore today because uh, people have been asking us to do, do different topic type base. If you have a topic that if you see this and you're thinking, hey, this is a topic I think you should explore, send it into one of us and we'll find somebody to get on here and we'll chat about it uh, and give you our thoughts. But today what we're going to be talking about is uh, tournaments and competing, uh, whether you're competing is with a weapon or empty handed or any Ido. And we're going to be talking about some of the pros and cons of, uh, of competing. Like what are some of the benefits of competing? And what are some of maybe the downfalls of competing or the negative side? And I guess what I want to do is I just want to go around the horn. Um, we'll end with me because I'm going to ask the first question. Uh, and I'm going to go in the order of my screen, not necessarily rank this time. So I said to Suino for it'll be to you first and then Sensei Benson and then Kyoshi Rice and then Hunchy Legacy. And the question that I have is what is a personal moment of pride for you? We've all competed. What is one of the things that stands out in your mind? I'm really happy that this happened when I competed or I'm really proud of this. So Sensei Suino, what's something that stands out for you? Well, one of the things that I remember fondly is the first time I ever competed in Iaido in Tokyo. Uh, I was the only non-Japanese in that first tournament. Um, it was a day of a, approximately 300 people competing. And just to be able to go and withstand, you know, 12 hours in a, in a competition environment, uh, live, learn, watch, uh, and then do really, really well. And I was lucky enough to win my rank division that first time uh just a, a you know point of pride to step into a completely new alien world and be able to prevail what did uh, yamaguchi sensei say to you after was he happy after you competed or how was he yeah um uh but uh he was not necessarily a super outgoing guy so he he's like mm, good <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll see you next thursday and we'll train <laughs> yep Awesome. Thanks, Sensei. Sensei Benson. Um, I know yeah, what so yours is going to be, by the way. I think I know. Well, I want, yeah, you probably do. Um, you know, the, I, I've competed probably less than anyone else on the show, but the one year that I did win the gold at a tournament, um, yeah, I'm proud of that, but it, it's twofold. One is that it was the first time I told myself I was going to win. Like I trained for months with the mindset because I think I'd always had a little bit of fear around competing. So I was like, hey, as long as I compete, that's good enough. And so I, I, I was willing to risk losing for real by admitting I wanted to win. But more importantly, Sensei, um, and we haven't talked about this a ton. I did what you said to get that winning point. You know, I laid back, I waited. Um, it was just, I think about the last time I competed and didn't win, I got the silver. I didn't do that. So in any case, my pride was about committing to winning even if it meant that I had to admit that I tried and lost, which is something I'd protect myself from. But really it was when it came time for that winning point, my in-ring instincts were like, do this one thing. And my, no, listen to your teacher, lay back, get that counter shot up under the ribs. And that did work. Awesome. Kyoshi Rice, prolific competitor. <laughs> it's been a long time, but I, competition, man. I, it, it was it's such a highlight. Um, I, I have I have two that really stand out in my mind and they're similar. So that's why I'm 
connecting them. Um, I was a green belt. So this is going back, you know, just, just a couple of years. And um, it was the Ontario Go Drew Karate Championships. It was in Ottawa. And, well, you know, we made the big drive up. And I had done a lot of competitions even by this point. Um, once we got there, uh, it was discovered that they were going to be combining divisions together. Historically, not a problem. It happens if there's low numbers. But they were combining men and women. And it was like, damn, okay. I, we, we trained, I trained only with men in the dojo, but when it came to competition, so I, I had this like little seed of doubt. Um, and I, I, I went in and I, and I won. And it was, it was such a great feeling because I went in so, I, I, had, I had almost defeated myself. And so when I stepped in, it's like, okay, win or lose, I just got to have a good time with this. I just drove six hours. It's, it's got to be fun. And so as soon as I eliminated that and just decided to have fun, it, it was a lot of fun. The trophy that I got is about this big for first place. And it's my favorite one. It's of, of the trophies of Elsa, I've got, it's, it's my favorite one. But then a similar happened. We were in Mexico competing. And um, when we, we hit the, the competition floor, I was up against people who had been my coaches and my teachers. And it was like, damn, how am I going to beat them? Wait a minute. Isn't that my job? That is my job to beat them. That is my job to train so that I can, you know, advance my art and, and, and surpass these guys. It's not going to happen today, but, and, and while it didn't, I did manage to stand on the platform with them. And that was enough that to just to know that I was shoulder to shoulder with people who were, who were my, my teachers and my role models. That was, it was pretty phenomenal. So those two stand out for me. Awesome. Amazing. Since legacy, I think I know what yours might be, or I know what your top three would be, but what's something that stands out that you're proud of from your competitive days? Well, uh, I don't want to mention 99s, except for the one I lost, which, you know, is Bill Hind. I fought Bill Hines at uh, the Canadian Championships for three overtime periods. And I lost to him by making a mistake. It was my fault. I just, I just made a mistake. But that was a great fight for me. I think it was a great fight for Bill too. He remembers that. Bless his soul. Um, but we'll go to another one and just say that uh, I fought Sato from Kyokushin Kaikan in New York City, and I did all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I, that's all I need to say and then uh, another time okay I'll just put a little bit of time in here at another time when I um, when I was at um, the championships in Toronto at, uh, I forget the name of the place but I was I walked in there as a brown belt and halfway Partway through uh, getting ready to go down to fight with the brown belts, my sensei called me up in the in the stands and he took my brown belt off, put a brown belt, or excuse me, a black belt around my waist, and he said, "You're going down over there to fight with the black belts." And I don't want to mention names, but the first person I fought was a very very tough Canadian champion figure. And everybody, I, I did win. And um, I got second place. Um, and then I got, everybody thought I was just lucky. And then I got set up to fight with him again in Hamilton. And I beat him again. So uh, for me personally, it wasn't winning. It was... Just fighting. You know, you all know winning winning a championship, the glory lasts as long as you're in the ring with the trophy. And then when you walk out, you put it together and dust with the rest. <laughs> so love that sense. I, I like I remember you telling me the story too about the second fight with that individual where they called your name and you ran up to the ring and then you heard all the papers shuffling while they could look for that person's name. 
And then they found that person's name and called his name out. And then you had to fight that person and you won the second time too. So. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was set up there a little bit, but that's okay. That makes you stronger, I guess. Right. For me, you know, I've uh, competed a lot of times too, lots of different places, really proud that I've been able to go compete in other countries. But I got to say, one of the highlights that stands out for me is, I, I think it was in Panama, Sensei Legacy was actually giving out the medals there. Uh, one of the people, dignitaries, putting medals on people's necks. And in that association, you didn't know the scores when you're in the ring for Kata. Mm -hmm. You don't know because they wrote it down on a piece of paper and then they handed it in and then they waited until the nighttime show when they would announce who the winners were. And I had won in Kabuto. And so I came up and said, so I guess you put the, the medal on my neck and then they do the rest of it. And then I got called up again and I had won in Kata and they put the medal on my neck. And when I went behind the stage, cause we were giving the medal back, they were just using the same medals to present to everybody. And I hugged Sensei Legacy and said, Sensei, we won the Triple Crown. Because I already knew I had won in fighting. That was not the surprise, right? Because when you leave the ring, you were either the one who won or you're the one who didn't. And so for me, a really great memory for me of my competitive days was being in a foreign country, having won those first two divisions, and then being behind this curtain with Sensei Legacy and giving him a hug and saying, we won the triple crown because I knew I was going to get called back up to, for fighting. That was a really good moment for me. Benson, what do you want to ask? Well, I got a great question, uh, or at least one that's really interesting to me. And so, you know, Sensei Dolphin, let's, let's take me and you. We've been fighting together for over 25 years. Like my toughest fights have been alone with you in squash courts, in your club. No one else is around, no third person in the ring, but I also know how important competing is. So I want to start with you, Kyoshi Rice, knowing that, you know, karate is something that's built out of a place that didn't have tournament rings and knowing that our toughest fights probably don't happen in the ring. Talk about the benefit and what you get from competing either kata or, or sparring type stuff. Wow. <laughs> that, that is, that is a, such a huge question because yeah. I, like, I could literally talk about it for the next hour and a half um, because the benefits are, are, are massive. Like um, it, nothing will, will, aside from having to really defend your, your life, nothing is going to challenge you the same way that a competition will because your, your nerves and your anxiety and your fears all bubble to the surface as soon as you step into the ring, whether it's kata or kumite, it, it's all there. Um, so the, the benefits, there's the benefits of training for a competition. There's the benefits of actually competing. There's the benefits of, of being a coach. Um, I, I really believe that it, it, it's an, it's an all encompassing thing because it, it challenges every part of your physical, mental, emotional, martial arts development. Um, win, lose, win or lose. Um, I, I mean, I've got my greatest learning experiences from the losses. So um, yeah, that, that's such a huge answer. Well, I, I, I want to throw this to, let's say Sensei Suino next, but I actually want you to crack that open a little bit. So, you know, I've learned more in my life from losing, but w w what, what does that mean for you? Like we want to win, right? So why do we benefit maybe more by losing? Um, so for me personally, uh, it started off being a, a roller coaster of emotions that I needed to learn how to control. So when I went to my very first competition, I had to be bribed by the senpai of my dojo to go. I really didn't want to go. I had no interest. I was fearful. Even though I was an athlete prior to that, I, like prior to karate competition, I competed in other sports. The, the idea of being up there by myself, solo performing and being judged was just not something that that I looked forward to. So my first competition, I went in, I did it, I won, it's great. Like, hey, okay, I like this. And what I realized was I liked the feeling of winning, <laughs> but it took until my next competition to do that. Because the next time I went in, I went in all full of confidence, arrogance, as one does when they are 18 years old and just won at their previous tournament. So, and I lost and I, I lost embarrassingly. 
And it was my arrogance that lost it for me. So I, I went from this very fearful to, wow, this is amazing to, wow, this is terrible to girl, what are you doing? And so I had to put it all into perspective and figure out, okay, what does winning mean? What does losing mean? What does competition mean? So I was able to get that very early on in my training because I, I, I was a yellow belt, I believe, mm. when all of this started. Like it was, it was very, very early. And it, it kind of set me on that path to level out those, those feelings. So I was able to control I tend to be a pretty high, strong, anxious kind of a type person. So the not being able to control the outcome of a tournament. Oh, okay. Sorry. If I can't control the outcome, I don't want to do it, but this yeah. had, this forced me to do that. So for me, that was a, an important learning skill that I carried through my whole life. Those two tournaments really set me on a course for a lot of things that I have done since. I love that. I love that you had to face the emotional part of it so early on. Um, Sensei Suino, you know, we've got these classical arts, especially something like Iaido. Goes back to, I mean, such a wonderfully brutal history with a sword. So then where does competing in either the Judo or the Iaido benefit? And then also, what is the value of losing? Well, the benefits are, are, are many. Um, I'll just echo something Kyoshi Rice mentioned. I think one of the huge benefits is not in the experience itself, but in the preparation. You know, if you're a mindful competitor and you start working on your diet, your training, doing prep matches, working on your mindset, um, I think it's the same for testing. You know, it's not about the experience. Well, it is about the experience, but also the lead up, right, really transforms people. It forces them to train very intensely with a real uh, intentional uh, plan, uh, which is a place I love to be. I love having a mission, working on the mm -hmm. mission, and competition gives you that opportunity. So that's one of the benefits, one of the many benefits. It's just that prep time. Uh, uh, benefits of losing. You know, I've always struggled a lot more with losing fights like in judo or in, or in sparring, you know, karate sparring, one-on-one uh, -on -one privately in the dojo. Uh, that's always been harder. It's if I have an ego problem about losing, that's where I suffer. I've never gone into a tournament with expectations. Uh, try hard. And then for whatever reason, I just live in the moment. So I've, I've never been disappointed by also never done worse than second place. So I'm not quite sure what, what losing means in those, in those contexts. But um, yeah, I suffer a lot more when I lose to somebody that I think I should beat one-on-one on, -one on you know, mm -hmm. rolling in the dojo or, or sparring in judo. Yeah, right on. Thanks. What about you, Sensei Dofa? And then we'll go to Hanchi after. Uh, a thing that's rattling around in my head is that a beginner is in search of answers and a master is in search of more questions. And when you compete, um, that pressure, if you keep competing for, a, uh, if you compete one time, there's an evolution in competing as there is in martial arts. Like there's something that happens to you as you compete and compete and compete. Right. So, and it's the pressure that causes that, uh, you know, when you start, as a yellow belt, like maybe through to a brown belt, there's a lot of fear and anxiety and a lot of it's linked to ego and injury, right? You're afraid to get embarrassed. You don't want people to, to judge you or you're scared that that person standing across the ring from you is just going to kick your ass. Like you're going to find yourself sliding out of the ring somewhere and being hurt. Um, when you start to get better at it, I found for myself personally, I started to get excited about it, like the tournament and that, that stuff, people staring at you, you're like, I can't wait. Like, I can't wait to be the center of attention here. I can't wait to fight that person. I mm -hmm. want to be the person in front of 300 people. Like, I want to do it, right? Like, that's, I've reached this level. And I think the final, and where I started to actually get pretty good is when you start to detach from everything. You, you walk in and you're like, I don't care what the referees think about me. I don't care what this competitor tries to do to me. I know what I've done. I know where I've been. I feel secure in myself and I'm just excited to get in here and do it. And, and I'm detached from all the opinions and all the outside stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I think when you look in the UFC and people like that, you hear like Mike Tyson talk about stuff like that, right? People who could beat him in the gym, but they couldn't deal with the lights as they were walking mm -hmm. out to the ring, right? That, that the walk to the ring was where they had lost before they got in the ring with him. Right? Oh, and I'm that. happy that I, I got to a point where, you know, the walk to the ring never bothered me anymore. Yeah. Like I just could walk to the ring and 
I could stand outside the ring and I could watch people and I didn't care because I knew what I was going to do when I got in there and I didn't care what anybody thought of it. Mm -hmm. How important is losing? Man, I've lost lots of times. Uh, uh, you learn the most, obviously. You form great relationships through losing too. That's another thing, right? You form really, you get a lot of respect um, mm -hmm. for that person that you lost to, right? Like you, sometimes they become your best friends, like people that uh, just become such, such good people to you and they push you on too, right? Like you're only really a loser if you stop, right? If you keep fighting and you keep going, you're not a loser. It's when you give up that you're a loser, right? Love that. Hanshi, anything you wanna to add to the, the need to compete or the, the joy of losing? Oh well, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Nick said it well, you know, it ups. When you're in competition and, and you don't train hard, uh, you don't train as hard. You're not as precise, you're not as sharp. So the preparation is big, is what Sensei Suino said. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that fully. Um, the other thing is about fighting in a dojo if it's your best way of uh, practicing your reflexes and to positioning yourself and learning things that you should do but there are there are other things that you don't benefit like uh, you know if you're facing somebody on the street and he's a drug crazed or drunk and you give him a shot and he just smiles at you um, you don't really get that um, fear and people don't like to admit that they're scared or fear, but it's like cutting yourself, you know? If you bleed, it's warning you that something is wrong. Mm. And, you know, when people say, oh, I'm not scared and they are scared, they're overlooking what their body's trying to tell them. It could be making you more cautious, you know? I'm afraid of heights, so I wouldn't. So it makes me cautious. So I know if I go up and stand there, I may get dizzy and fall off or something. So it's a type of warning that you have and you need to develop that. Mm. Thanks, yeah. Anchi. Oh, I'm not quite done. If you don't mind, I just got a couple more things. Uh, or are we in a hurry? No. Oh, okay. The best, the best thing in martial arts, because you don't get hit and you don't know well, you do sometimes. Reggie and I hit each other a little bit. But in most cl classical karate clubs and karate clubs, there is not a heavy impact. And you don't know if you can go on. Some people, uh, I had a lady one time, she just joined and the guy threw a reverse punch and just barely touched her chin. She did a breath in and couldn't breathe out. I had to make her start breathing. So there's a lot of different things that in a real fight that show up, that don't show up in a dojo. Because you have a referee standing there, he's going to ensure that you're not hurt. I'll try to prevent that. So that's one other thing. And losing builds character. Mm. If you lose, you'll train harder. It tells you where you are. Okay, and winning tells you where you are also for that tournament. Right, because certain people are not there and other, other different people are. So whenever you face another opponent at any time, it's a completely different story. So winning, is, winning and losing are both teachers and by necessity are the same side or two different sides of the same group. There's a lot more, but I'll just stop. Love that. Thanks. So I don't know what people, where we want to go with this. If uh, I don't necessarily want to end on a negative, right. And I know we're, we still got like 10, 15 minutes to chat here. I don't want to end on a negative. Um, but a question that I have for everybody is about tournament prep. Right. And I also want to get into a little bit, like what are some of the pitfalls of competing? Uh, but let's talk with, about tournament prep for a second. Like what, what is it that you did to prep, to get ready for events, big events? Um, 
And I guess I'll start with you, Kiyoshi Rice, and then I'll direct it once you're done to who. What did you do to get ready for the tournaments that you competed in? <clears throat> so that process evolved. Um, so I, I had some okay coaches uh, through, uh, so I had some great teachers, but not necessarily great competition coaches, um, whether they had no interest in competing themselves or, or, or didn't have the experience, whatever the case may be. So I, it was a lot of trial and error over the years, um, but training, 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 but cross training as well. Um, making sure that my, my diet was on point. Sleep was a big obstacle for me. And I, I had my worst competitions after I didn't take care of sleep. That was a major one for me personally. It's something that I've always struggled with. Um, but in preparation leading up, it depend, It really it did depend on, on the competition, what I was doing. Was I going in just as a kata competitor? Was I going in um, as a triple threat? All of those things really varied things up. Um, I actually didn't start fighting in competition until after I was a black belt. So um, I, I had to, to kind of teach myself how to prepare for, for the, the fighting competition after I'd already had a number of years of competition experience. But um, I already had a, a fairly rigorous training schedule. So I, I didn't up the ante at all before going into competition. More of that came afterwards where I would dissect my performance and then now create a new training plan from the end of competition one until I got to competition two. So you know, adapting my, my training regimen based on the outcome. Um, and, and I don't mean win or lose, I mean, just my own personal experience in the ring and then adapt that to my training schedule. So um, I, I've been very lucky that I've always been a professional martial artist. I haven't had to battle around having a day job. So I, I really had the luxury of being able to go in the dojo for, you know, two, three, four hours and just bang out a workout that got me ready for the competition. So I'm kind of spoiled that way. Um, but preparation really was dependent on where I was in my competition cycle. Amazing. Benz, how about you? Um, you know, never having done circuit type stuff for me, it's always about the mental commitment. You know, it's been talked about a bit, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But from the moment I sign up and commit, everything changes. And now it's like, I'm not eating that. I'm going to bed at this hour. I'm going to add in this. Um, and that leads right up to that moment of standing opposite the other person in the ring, you know, not being all super chatty four minutes before. Um, and I, I noticed the difference when I lay back on that. I don't do as well. Uh, because all of a sudden it becomes a hangout instead of a competition. And that goes back to a bit of the last question, which is for me, the big thing is this has to happen now. Like, you know, in free sparring for 45 minutes, you know, sometimes the, the, the first moment mattering can fade a little because you're working for so long and you're, you're going deep. But in that tournament, it's like this has to happen now or you'll lose. This has to happen now or you'll lose. And so for me, the moment of committing and going, I'm going to do this. It's the mental commitment to this exists in time and space. Like the fight's going to happen. You don't get to ease into it. That's really what it comes down to for me is the mental prepper. I'm not easing in. Awesome. So I like, see, what do you want to pitch in on that? How did you prepare for the tournaments that you were competing in or how well, did you get prepared? Who, who prepared you? Well, I prepared me. Uh, the thing between you and I is going to sound maybe a little egotistical but you know how we train in our dojo uh, and our, de our dad said it I didn't really have to do much more uh, same as you if you train all the time and you're a true martial artist you're in your top shape all the time all right and um, all I did really was fired fired and fired I kept pushing to try to move my back fist faster, my punch faster, mm. like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times every day so that when somebody moved, my reaction would be very, very quick. So that's mainly what I did with everything. Just give myself a little tune-up before, okay? And just 
fired and just fired those, those muscle fibers so that they would just flow, right? Um, and uh, the main thing I want to mention that we never before everybody is saying how we entered the ring. When I entered the ring, I see no one except my opponent, right? And my mind is empty. If I go in any other way, I've always failed. Well, I, I won. But I find that it's a failure, in my opinion. If your mind has something on it, if you think you know how this guy is going to fight, it's okay to know and be able to recognize it, but you have to do it not going in thinking about that, going in with an empty mind so that when that arises, there'll be no confusion within your own mind. What you're doing. Yes. I think that's a big thing about fighting. So, uh, Ali just stood there with his hands hanging by his side. And when the guy moved, he reacted. He, the other thing about react, have, uh, Ali having his hands down by his side was, can you see this? And then when it starts to move, you can see it. Can you see this? That's why Ali had his hands down by his side. He kept his hands out of your vision. Mm. And if you try to do that, it gives you that other part of the second to catch the guy on, on a reflex. A punch only takes one quarter of a second. All right. So when it's coming, you have you have to move really quickly. So if I remove part of that from keeping my hands out of your, your sight, the person will pick it up. Your eyes pick up 126 million different shades and colors at the blink of an eye. So you have to sort of play with person's vision a little bit and like, with an empty mind. Thanks, Anchi. Vincent Sino, what did you do for prep? How did you prepare for, I don't know, Judo or Iaido, or how did Yamaguchi Sensei prepare you? Well, in both arts, it was very similar prep in one sense, and that is I just practiced my ass off, right? So in Judo, it was, you know, you know, free sparring over and over and over and over and over again. In Iaido, it was doing the, you know, first Yamaguchi Sensei and I would pick out the forms, you know, five, seven, ten forms. And then I practiced in front of him until he was satisfied. And, you know, three months ahead of a tournament, I'm doing those form sets. I go through a set, takes 10 minutes. Maybe I train for an hour and a half. So I run through it. How many times is that? Nine times through my set of 10. I'll do that. I, I would have I done that once, twice, or three times a day for three months leading up to tournaments. Uh, so it's muscle memory, right? Which kind of goes to that detachment you were talking about. When I'm there doing judo, you know, a combative or a kata like Iaido, it's detached because the stuff is muscle memory. Mm. Um, but one thing I found really interesting when Hachi Legacy was talking about it is kind of that mindset that you go into it. You know, you said you just see your opponent. There's something about that. It's small in daily life. Like when I'm getting ready to teach a class at the dojo, I really prefer nobody talks to me for 10 minutes ahead of time. Like I'm kind of getting myself in that mindset. When I go into a tournament, I really don't want anybody to talk to me for an hour ahead of time. Um, I, I don't know I fight better like that or not, but I like the, I like that stillness that comes from knowing there's about to be something really mm really intense going on i like to get in that mindset not not be casual about it i think that helps me awesome sensei let's throw that question to you and then let's have you answer first for our last question as we are, are winding down here on what are the pitfalls i mean we all know we love competing we all know we're going to keep doing it so it's okay to end on pitfalls but if you could answer your um, preparation and then pivot yourself into the the potential pitfalls of competing I did what everybody else did. Um, mm. The only thing I would add to it would, uh, I worked out my problems in the dojo. So if I thought I was going to be trying a certain thing, a certain sparring technique, let's say, or I was going to be pausing, holding a key eye, holding a movement, I tried to work that out in the dojo. So if there was like a certain combination, I was trying to, I just get in the ring with the killers that we have in our dojo. And then I'd figure out really quick, you're not doing this. Like, this is a fantasy. You have this in your mind that you can do this, but it's <laughs> not going to work out. The reality is not going to, not going to be there. Um, so, and then the second thing I would say about what did I do to prepare? I did what my teacher told me to do. 
Uh. Right? I, I had a sensei who competed, who knew how to compete, who knew how to fight. And I just did what they, what Sensei Legacy told me to do. Um, you know, and like Sensei Suino, I did things like when I decided to compete in Iaido, I only had six weeks to prep myself and I didn't know that system. So the first thing I did is figure out the five cuts I was going to do. And I did those things every damn day until I trashed my shoulder and <laughs> but, but it was done. Mm-hmm. So, and then you want to ask me the question about pitfalls about competing? Yeah, we may as well have you and then we'll pivot out on that. Um, I think uh, you got to be really careful when you compete that you don't buy into your own mystique, right? And you don't tell yourself that because I did this or that, it really doesn't mean much when it comes to getting back in the dojo or standing on the sidewalk, right? The, those people don't really care as much. I guess the other pitfall about it that I would say, and then I'm going to move on quick, is that when you're competing, you're training a really narrow slice of what the total art is. And so if you, comp- if you convince yourself that you're great at that art because you won a world championship or you did something, I think that's a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. You've been operating in a little bit of a fantasy world. And when you get back to the reality of what the art actually is, right, it's probably something much more vast and, and complete. And you've only been training and practicing a very small slice of it. Um, Thanks for that. Kiyoshi Rice. So total agreement with uh, Sensei there. It's, you can definitely get caught up in, in the mystique of your own success or mired by the, um, you know, the, the troubles that you have in competition and then let that define you as a martial artist as well. And, and neither are true. And then also for, for certain, it, it, it's, uh, it can be limiting to focus only on competition. Um, for me, what I see as pitfalls don't necessarily relate necessarily to competition itself. Um, uh, I, I've met so many people in competition. I've met mostly great people and I've met some assholes. Sorry, can I say that? That's yeah. Part of one. <laughs> Gonna bleep me out there. Um, but what I, so either somebody is inherently uh, uh, an asshole or their experience has lent them that way. I, I look to the coaching on that one because I think that coaches have a huge responsibility when they send their athletes in to make sure that they are sending in the whole athlete and then tempering their their wins and losses um, in the dojo afterwards. So one of the pitfalls that I see, you know, it's like there are no bad dogs, just bad dog owners. I I see it the same way. Um, You know, you've got people who really develop very poor character skills through their competition experience because it hasn't been tempered by somebody else on it. They, They haven't had that 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 knocking down in the dojo necessarily or the knocking down in the ring. Um, and, and I, I, I see that, I see coaching as a huge part of that. And just being a good karate teacher doesn't make you a good coach. Coaching is a whole separate animal. And, um, I, I, it, for me, that's the pitfall that I see. Love that. I like that. You just said that, uh, Sensei Sweeno. Pitfalls of competition. Uh, well, the, the common stuff, right? Like, uh, injuries. Although if you train hard in your home dojo, you still suffer with those. You having to wait forever for your turn. You know, you go all day competition, <laughs> right? Like freaking eight hours. Uh, in the old days, when I competed in judo, weigh-ins were a bitch, right? You know, you show up early and you can't have breakfast till eleven, and then you have this giant breakfast because you haven't eaten in forty-eight hours, and then you have to compete an hour later. That sucks. Um, <laughs> uh, Focusing on rule sets. I mean, you guys um, um, already addressed this to some degree, but you focus on tournament rule sets, right? That's a limited world um, and you you have to have it for tournaments, but that doesn't reflect real life fighting necessarily. Mm -hmm. The biggest difference, and we've talked about this many, many times on Punch, Kick, Choke, and Chat, and that is uh, a a real badass, not even, that's not the right word, a real bad human being outside doesn't give a shit about you, your respect, or rule sets or anything else right there are really dangerous mercenary people out there and i'm not sure i mean tournaments prepare you better than not training but it's not the same thing Mm. thanks sensei anchi everybody said basically what i was going to say i'm just going to go along with some of uh, 
some of the things that will make you fail sometimes is, is when you go in there with an idea that you've got somebody figured out or, or you have a plan for this person, it's all wrong. Right? People are all different. They move, they're gonna do a different technique than you expect. You know, the only thing you can really rely on is that when you're facing an opponent, they're normally gonna attack you with their best technique. Nobody's gonna attack you with their second best technique in order to win, right? So it's always good and good, smart to watch the fights before you. If you don't do that, that's a big mistake, big mistake. Okay, just like for instance, um, um, I was just a uh, showdown or a knee down when I fought Billy Hines and he was like a third or fourth man. And he just beat me by experience, by being more relaxed than me. Uh, I don't want to explain how, how I lost that fight, but it was like so simple, just because um, I had no experience. You need that. You really need that experience. Okay. And um, don't rely on certain techniques. If you, if you rely on certain techniques, other people will see them in you and they'll already be ready. So that's all that's all I can muster up on that one right now. Sorry. Um, I just have three quick comments and then I want to throw it to Sensei Dolphin to, to take us home. And um, one is, is that for me, the pitfall is actually how others perceive the art. You know, something like, oh, if the guy knocks someone out, and then the guy who knocked the person out gets disqualified. Well, we know you're playing to a rule set and we understand that, but other people looking from the outside in, the pitfall of the competition is now that they go, oh, that art must not be legit because they're watching so much MMA or whatever. And it's like, you know, even MMA has rule sets because you can't bite or gouge. So, you know, to me, that's one of the, the only pitfalls I see in my own life. And then two quick things someone had to before is, you know, GSP is my goat, right? Like numbers may suggest other people, but he's my greatest of all time. His two losses that he then came back a better fighter, going back to the why losses are important. I think he's the goat because of those losses. He unlocked how he had to learn his opponents and fight that set a template for all those nine title defenses. And also going to GSP, Hanshi, you mentioned this, like if you maintain a certain level, you don't necessarily need to change much come competition time. And I mean, if you look at that guy right now as a retired fighter, he's in the best shape of his life because he's a martial artist first and then was a professional fighter second. And I really love that about the man. So you saying a GSP love fest, but when I think of competitors, he comes to mind as my favorite. Sensei Dofa, how do you want to take us out tonight? Yeah, I just want to say thanks to everybody for providing the time in these comments. And I'm not sure when this is going to air. It'll air, it'll go on YouTube and then we'll share it around on Facebook and different places. And if you like it, hit the follow, put some comments in. Even if you don't like one of our comments, if you think we're dead wrong, please mm -hmm. feel free to share that opinion. We want to hear it. Yep. Uh, you just won't have the platform when we trash talk you later. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just want to say thank you to everybody for doing this. And I look forward to the next one. And today is actually a, 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 a unique day for Punch Kick Joe Chat because later on tonight, we're going to be talking to uh, Grandmaster Joe Corley in the long form yeah, podcast. Really looking forward to that. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Right, nice seeing you, Dad.